On a summer night in Detroit, a white auto worker kills a Chinese American engineer, but never spends a day in jail. A timeless story of race and injustice in America. Who killed Vincent Chin on POV? Monday evening at nine. Tonight on Montana PBS. Steady Go was one of the UK's first rock and pop music TV shows. Enjoy a look at this iconic music series with performances by the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Otis Redding, and more in Best of the 60s. Ready, Steady Go! Saturday night on Montana PBS. At Montana PBS, we have built a legacy of quality and trust. The characters and personalities we've put on our air have become some of the most recognizable and beloved icons in our culture. Welcome to the French Chef. This is Julia Child. Our viewers believe in us and communities across the state have integrated us into their lives. I gotta have a little house here. This is just perfect place for a house. Through sponsorship, your business can become a part of that legacy. You can proudly support a history and treasured service and receive recognition for your generosity in the form of an on-air spot. Ernie, get out of the tub. Reinforce a commitment to community. Become a sponsor of Montana PBS. To learn more, visit montanapbs.org slash partnerships. These home cooks are being put to the test. This is everything that I dreamed of. But are they up to the challenge? I go from flustered to panic. We want to fall in love with your recipe. It's go time. Follow 10 cooks from across the country as they prepare their unique family dishes, judged by celebrity chefs. That is a perfect recipe. And compete to see who has the great American recipe. Ready to cook your hearts out? Friday evening at 8. Programming on Montana PBS is made possible in part by viewers like you. And by the Montana Nursery and Landscape Association, a trade association of horticulture professionals who can assist with yard, gardening, and outdoor space questions. Members in your area can be found at plantingmontana.com. And by the Montana Farmers Union, a grassroots organization working for family farmers, ranchers, and rural communities. Online at montanafarmersunion.com. Com. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. Good evening. Welcome to another edition of Montana Ag Live. Originating tonight from the studios of KUSM on the very dynamic campus of Montana State University and coming to you over your Montana public television system. I'm Jack Riesman, retired professor of plant pathology. I'm happy to be your host this evening. A lot of you have watched the program in the past. You know how it works. Those of you who have not, there'll be a phone number on the screen if you have questions for a steam panel in our culture. I'll introduce her in a moment. But first of all, let me introduce the entire panel. On my far left is Mary Burroughs. Mary is part-time in the dean's office, most time being a plant pathologist. And she does a great job at both. Our special guest tonight, Kathleen Williams. Found out this year that Kathleen Williams is now the state director for the USDA Rural Development Program. Congratulations on that, Kathleen. I know you did a great job. And rural development is big in this state, and we need it. So we'll have a little discussion about that as we go along. Another kind of a guest tonight is Patty Fleming. 
Patty is with the Montana Manufacturing Extension Service, and Patty is also very interested in rural development. And Patty, you know, you're the only male other than me on the panel, and that's been <laughs> kind of the way it's been all spring. So, and here's Miss Jane Mangold again, our invasive weed scientist. How does that work? That works. Okay, and answering the phone this evening, John Holly and uh, Nancy Blake. So with that, folks, I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen and tell her about her position here in rural development in Montana. Thank you, and it's great to be with you all. I think, as I mentioned, 20 years ago I was on the show, so it's great to be back. Um, the State Director for Rural Development, it's a USDA appointment. It's a presidential appointment, so I serve at the, the pleasure of President Biden. Um, it's one of four state-based federal appointments, um, and so there's 40 some, 47 of me across the state, or across the nation, excuse me. Um, and really, rural development is a sub-agency of the USDA, like the Forest Service, like the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and, and our mission is to sustain and um, help with the uh, vitality and economic success of rural America, and in this case, rural Montana. So it's super exciting to be in this position. You know, we visited a little bit ahead of the program tonight, and Patty, you can jump in too, but you know, Montana has basically two sides to it. The eastern side, which I love eastern Montana, I think it's one of the most beautiful places in the lower 48 states, but the economic development in eastern Montana is not as vibrant right now as in the western part of the state. How do you think we can address maybe improving the economic future of eastern Montana? Well, um, there's lots of options. Uh, it's very, eastern Montana and central Montana very much ag-based, so we've got some programs to try and help address some of the issues that are affecting our farmers and ranchers, um, whether it's the consolidation in the meat processing industry, we've got programs that are working to try and advance uh, local and regional meat processing. Um, there's also uh, uh, programs to help uh, with rural health care, um, with utilities. I mean, these small communities don't have the tax base to be able to uh, charge the fees for, say, a wastewater treatment plant or a, or a water supply plant. And so we help build those kinds of facilities in these small communities to, to help those communities provide the services that, that people expect and hopefully uh, with those services, people will both stay in rural Montana and maybe relocate. Okay. Patty, the extension, manufacturing extension. Have you guys done any programs or developed any businesses, say in Glendive or Scobie or Plentywood? Absolutely. We, uh, we work with all the manufacturers in Montana. We actually only have two counties in Montana that have zero manufacturers. That's Treasure and Petroleum. Uh, we have lots of clients throughout uh, eastern Montana. What we have seen is there's kind of a correlation between if a small town does have a manufacturer, it tends to make them more sustainable. Uh, we're seeing some great improvements in some of these small towns recently. When you look at uh, Phillipsburg, Phillipsburg Brewing is a main, ma main part of uh, Phillipsburg's growth. Uh, even you go to Scobie, we've got Farver Farms and Scobie doing great things. Uh, the value-added ag is really important for, uh, for eastern Montana, in my opinion, where we, can, we don't have to worry about <coughs> shipping in raw materials, but we can uh, draw on the raw materials that are already in the area, such as meat processing, uh, beer, anything with the pulse crops. So there's lots of examples in these small towns, Big Sandy Organics. Okay. So. You know, we'll get into that a little bit more and some of the constraints that maybe a Scobie or a Glendive or a Phillipsburg may have. Uh, before we do that, Mary, we had a question come in via Facebook, and this person from Bozeman has a bunch of big softballs, which I'm not sure what she means, on their juniper. Uh, what do you think that is, and uh, do they need to control it? Uh, actually, our weed specialist, Tim Seifel, sent me pictures of him his last week. Okay. So um, I, did, I did get it up just in case we got that question. It's cedar apple rust. 
and you can see a, a picture of it here. Uh, and this is from our Pest Problems and Identification of Ornamental Shrubs and Trees in Montana book. And you can see what host it occurs on. Probably can't read it on the TV screen, but if you have a copy. Um, and then what the symptoms are and how to manage it. And mostly for seal or apple rust, um, you'll see these big balls on your juniper and then on your apples or your hawthorns, you'll see um, just these um, spots, which to a pathologist are beautiful. <laughs> and I'm seeing them in my neighborhood right now. There's no real reason to control them. Um, they don't harm the tree very, you know. They're pretty. They are pretty. <laughs> it's just like Christmas came early in June. Oh, well, I, it's Halloween to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Only plant pathologists would say that. Oh, that's, that's pretty. what you always say. <laughs> All right, uh, Jane, uh, from Helena, this person wants to know is weed seed free forage? Also, pesticide-free or organic? Uh, well, that sort of de depends. So someone can grow forage that's certified as weed seed free. And the whole idea behind that is you're using f forage that, you know, you're not moving seeds, weed seeds around in that forage. So it sort of depends. If the, if the field didn't have any weeds to begin with, there wouldn't have been any spraying done to control the weeds. So, um, you know, it might be pesticide free, but if you see weed seed free, um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's pesticide free or organic or anything like that. That would be a different certification. Do they certify any of the hay or as organic in the state? Does anybody oh. know? There, I mean, there, there's probably organic hay, but again, that would be a different certificate. If it's certified organic, that would be a different certification process than the weed seed free forage and building materials program. Okay, thank you. A uh, question for both Kathleen and Patty. Um, do you, either of you, believe that uh, high speed internet? is limiting the ability for rural development in the state and manufacturing? I do. Absolutely. I mean, it's not a nice to have anymore. You have to, to, to participate in education, in healthcare, in business, in precision ag. You, you okay. need high-speed internet. And so that's one of the reasons there are, there are some pretty major sets of um, resources coming down. We have a at Rural Development, we have something called the ReConnect program, which is investing in especially underserved areas. Um, but the, okay. the bipartisan yeah. infrastructure yeah. law has a lot of resources in it for, for internet. Um, okay. So yeah, we're just really trying to close that digital divide, um, much as, okay. as electrification in the 30s. Um, yeah, well, that's a good analogy, yeah. Yeah. excellent analogy. Yeah. Um, Patty, are there areas of Rural areas of state that have pretty good high-speed internet now. I don't think I. I don't have that information. Okay. I'd probably have to defer to Kathleen on this. There, there's a statewide uh, broadband coordinator that's uh, an employee of the state, and it's her role to. Um, and I hope I hope she agrees with what I'm going to say, but um, to to develop and and we want to participate in it, um, a statewide plan um, on how to take all these disparate sources of resources. And they've just, um, uh, they hired a, a, a contractor to put together a, a map. Even, even getting a map of where the service is and isn't has been challenging. I've been trying to do that for 12 years probably. Okay. So we're finally starting to get some mapping and so that we can see where people are or aren't served. And even, even building that map is challenging. So, so I think you'll, in Montana, we're gonna see a real push and hopefully a lot of coordination on, okay. on getting broadband out there where I, it's needed. There was okay. an article in one of the major papers this morning just on rural broadband. Oh. And they said even if it was accessible, it wasn't affordable right. for many people. So that's another big challenge. Right, and this administration actually has a program that helps people pay for it too. So if you've got it, but you can't use it because you can't afford it, then there. I think it's a $35 subsidy that, that people that are very low income can apply for and get some help. So, yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Patty from Lewistown, you mentioned value-added agriculture. This person would like to know a few examples of what value-added agriculture is and how the manufacturing center uh, helps develop these. Sure, so value-added ag is manufacturing uh, where you start off with something that was grown or raised. So food and beverage is a lot of it. Uh, examples include uh, High Country Beef Jerky in Lincoln. Uh, Farver Farms is doing a, a Pulse Snack Cracker, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, we have Big Sandy Organics doing Crackling Kamut. Uh, all the breweries are value-added ag. All the meat processors are value-added ag. And we provide assistance to them in pretty much any area they need. Um, we have a staff of uh, manufacturing consultants uh, that consist of engineers and MBAs that will travel to these facilities and help them uh, grow, innovate, and become more profitable. Great program. I, I like that idea. I think we have a, an image of, uh, we, we have a value-added egg program as well, okay. and I think one of our images is of the Rome-free Rome ranch. Uh, and um, we'll see if we can get that aired. Yeah, so that's a... Um, this is a value-added um, project that we helped fund. I don't know if you guys were involved with that too, but they make something called Bison Bites. Um, and they just got the contract for uh, all of the Costco's in the Northwest. So That's big. It is, absolutely big. And, and to keep that contract, we need to buy Bison Bites. So there's a plug. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's a family-run operation uh, near Hot Springs. And yeah, proud to be able to help. Okay, now, you say you help them get started. Is it a loan program, a grant program? How does this USDA Rural Development help directly? Right, so um, we offer both value-added producer grants and loans. So if someone's just starting out, they may get a grant, um, may qualify for a grant, and then as they get their feet under them and they, they need a little bit more to um, potentially bridge into getting commercial financing, then we may give them a loan or a loan guarantee. What we try and do is help businesses start, grow, and get sustainable. And so we, we kind of graduate them from grant to, to loan guarantee, to loan, to off, off and running with a commercial banker. And we work really closely with lenders as well. So, so we're working to help not only the farmers and ranchers, um, and, and businesses, but also the, the lending community that, because that is important infrastructure as well for the business community. You know, if you go into certain, I would say, specialty stores, higher end stores, and you look on the shelves, it's amazing how many Montana made products are on there. And on that note, I wanna ask, how do you qualify to get these little Montana made stickers? Is that program still really active? It is active. And there's not, it doesn't take much to get qualified for it. So uh, it's pretty easy to get those stickers. You just have to prove that you are making it in Montana. Okay, and support it when you see it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think there's it, an, it, isn't there an annual um, like like trade show sort yes. of for, for yeah. anything made in Montana? So it was yeah. in Helena this year. The you Montana know, Department of Commerce uh, funds a trade show okay for made in montana you products. know i have been to that trade show one time yeah and you don't want to go hungry because you know it leaves but yeah. it is pretty fascinating some of the products that are out there labor an issue in bringing these to f f market here in the state absolutely uh labor and housing uh and supply chain are the three big ones right now uh you know you talk about, well, let's move a, a big uh, meat processor into a small town in eastern Montana. There's no housing, so where are they going to live? So we can't hardly do that. So uh, that plus the uh, uh, supply chain issues and shipping into rural areas can be tri very challenging for value-added ag okay. producers. And we had uh, okay. the woman who runs the uh, Butte malting facility on and. Yes. Their transportation costs are really um, causing some significant okay. issues in trying to break into more markets. It's very pricey to move stuff out of the state right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. 
<coughs> from Missoula, Jane. Biocontrol of knapweed. Hmm. Other than pulling, I don't believe yeah. in pulling because that's work. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there are several insects, um, specialized insects available for biological control of knapweed. Actually, over the years, there's been 12 different agents developed and released for, for knapweed. Some of those agents are well established across the state, so I would encourage the person to uh, look for evidence of, the, of biocontrols they may already have that are suppressing plants. They, they, they don't always completely get rid of the plants, but they will stress them and make those plants less competitive. There's also, there are also some biocontrol, uh, one insect in particular, the Cyphocleonis weevil. It's a fairly big weevil that doesn't fly very well. It feeds on the roots and it's very effective. And that, that's one of the insects that doesn't get around as well because it's not a good flyer and may be worth uh, investing in some insects to release on their property. So I would recommend that the person check out, there's a website, it's MT biocontrol.org and it's the statewide uh, biocontrol coordination project and there's a lot of information on there including information about knapweed biocontrol and if there's any collection days coming up um, how to release it how to see if you have biocontrols already on your property so mtbiocontrol.org so talking about rural development economic development we have plenty of weeds in the state we know we know that <laughs> we do yeah is there a business opportunity out there for people rearing these insects and so forth and so on? Yeah, there are commercial, uh, they either collect it at, in places where the insects are well established uh, and then sell them or they are rearing some of these insects. There's also some of our, there's a couple different high school science classes that have rearing programs. Um, yeah, so, so that is that is, uh, there are people out there doing that, making a living doing it. And some picking huckleberries, too. Mm -hmm. Some pick, yes. Good. So, <laughs> yes, that works. Okay, um, from Billings, um, will Kathleen's office be assisting small towns devastated by recent flooding? It's a good question. Absolutely, um, and I just wanna say that, you know, my heart goes out to the folks in Red Lodge and, and Gardner and Livingston and, um, all the places that uh, have been affected. Um, and we are not frontline disaster response agency. We do have one element that we have, we have housing programs and including a multifamily housing program. And, and if there are vacancies in our multifamily housing projects, we can, there is a process where people that are displaced may be able to temporarily be housed in in our multifamily, but really where we'll probably come in the most is during the rebuild, the infrastructure, the, um, the, the, both the businesses and the sewer and water and wastewater and um, is probably these small towns, um, that's probably where we can be the most helpful. Okay, thank you, good question. Uh, Patty, you talk about rural development of uh, value-added products. Are there any high-tech small-town industries that have been developed in Montana? This question is from Winifred. Yes, in fact, uh, just about an hour south of there, I would say uh, there's a couple uh, great manufacturers in Lewistown uh, that are high-tech. One is called High Heat, and they are making uh, equipment to heat drums and control the temperature of that. You also have a manufacturer in Lewistown that's making all the air curtain doors for uh, Costco's and Walmart's. And thirdly, you have uh, 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 Spica Manufacturing and Design, which is making uh, access platforms for aircraft and spacecraft worldwide. And that's all done here in Montana? All done in Lewistown. <laughs> uh, that's, that's great, and you know, Lewistown, I shouldn't say this, I like Lewistown a lot, and it has not been found as much as Bozeman <laughs> and other areas of the state. If you've not been to Lewistown, it's worth a trip there. It's, it's a wonderful little community. They have a great little trail system through oh, town, too. Oh, wonderful, and it's right on Spring Creek if you like to fish. Uh, great trout fishing. So kudos <laughs> to uh, 
Lewis and, and I hope you kind of... the geographical center of the state at the yoga right. Right? That, that's right. Correct. <laughs> that's very correct. And on that note, <laughs> just a little bit west of Lewistown is Moxon, Montana. And this week on Tuesday is the Moxon Field Day. Uh, Wednesday, I believe. Wednesday. Yeah. And if you really, I, I'll give them credit, they serve great lunches there. And, if <laughs> and I then you to, can just go up the road to Haver and yeah, get a nice steak dinner Haver on the Thursday next night. Day, so yeah. <laughs> if you've not had a chance to attend some of these Ag Field Days, yeah, it's, it's worth it because you'll learn a lot and the chefs at Moccasin do a great I, job. I, I believe it is pork, pork again this year. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mary, I've got you up here. This is from Coffee Creek. And how many people know where Coffee Creek is? Okay. It's up in that part of the country, isn't That's it? That's right. Yeah. It's good and, pheasant yeah. hunting. Yeah, it is. It, you're, you nailed it. It's mm -hmm. great pheasant country up there. Uh, they are seeing a lot of powdery mildew on the winter wheat after the rain. Should we spray? A fungicide. Mary, that's yours. Yeah, you know, depending on the moisture coming up, our varieties are all, you know, a lot of guys have maybe gotten some frost damage or weren't able to adequately fertilize or, so, you know, think about what your yield potential realistically is and then make a fungicide application decision based on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kathleen, um, from Billings again, will your office be assisting? Uh, I did that one, sorry. This one is from Missoula. What are the roles of county commissioners in assisting rural development in eastern Montana? That's a good question also. Uh, well, we wouldn't be successful if we didn't have partners. So, so we work closely with local communities to both tell folks all the, I mean, we have, I think, at least 50 programs now, and it seems like there's a new one rolling out every week. So the more people that know uh, the resources that are available through USDA Rural Development is super helpful. Um, I was at the, the MACO gathering, the Montana Association of Counties, um, and we just find that so many people uh, don't know about the rural development programs, and so county commissioners are a great partner in getting that across, and, and they're, they're often looking for, um, f for utility types of assistance. Um, and I think we've got uh, a clip from um, a video that uh, where rural development helped uh, the town of Harleton build a wastewater treatment plant. So I think a lot of this is focusing on some of the, the nuts and bolts, but, um, but this was a, a great project that, um, that really helped a, a small town um, provide treatment for, for their town. And then also, of course, everyone is downstream from somebody, right? So, um, so, so they are treating it to a really high level. They're saving money for the town. And, um, and they're providing uh, clean water for the folks that are downstream that are drinking from the same source. So it's pretty exciting. Hamilton is an interesting story. I've been in this state a long time. Mm -hmm. And when I first moved here, there was a railroad. It was a railroad town, and that disappeared, and Harleton kind of dried up. Mm -hmm. But thanks to rural development, they have come back strong. Yeah. And I like Harleton. It's again, it's in the middle of nowhere, which you know, I'm not antisocial, but it's kind of neat to see that kind of part of the state. Yeah. Well, and there was a company called uh, Ticket River that just decided to locate there and um, created quite a few jobs. There's um, uh, an architect that we're working with that, that is working on projects where he finds historic buildings um, and is converting them into housing um, and multi-purpose uh, uh, commercial or mixed use and making it all LEED certified. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. And there's two value-added egg manufacturers in that town as well. Cream of the West has been there for, mm -hmm. for probably 30 plus years and we have a brewery there. So. Arlington has a brewery now. I may have to make a trip up there yeah. this week. How many do we have in the state? And last I heard, there was 89 or 90. It, it's over 100 now. It's over 100. Yeah. And there's some pretty good product out there. Yeah, we yeah. even have one in Weibo. I, and I've been there. <laughs> yes, yeah. I have. And actually, Weibo, yeah, I like this state. Weibo is a really interesting part of the state. Very. It sits just right next to North Dakota in that Theodore Roosevelt so National Park project. in North Dakota. Okay. If nobody's um, visited that, I'm that's fun to go to, but there's a great restaurant right off the interstate at Weeble, 
and you can stop there and eat, go to North Dakota and come back and stay in Montana. <laughs> That's the way I do it. Yeah. Okay. I was told the best prime rib in the state is in Weibo. So. It's awful good. Yeah. <laughs> yep, we tried it. All right, great. Uh, from Butte, a uh, Facebook question for Patty. How did the Montana Manufacturing and Extension Center come about? That's a good question, because I don't know a lot about it. So uh, in the 80s, the National Institute of Standards and Technology saw that uh, there was a, uh, uh, that the smaller manufacturers weren't getting world-class uh, consulting. And so they started this national network called the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. They partially fund the center in every state. The uh, MEPs uh, are not allowed to work with any manufacturer that has more than 500 employees, but our task is to help all the small manufacturers. And so uh, in 1996, uh, the Board of Regents approved it, and in uh, 1998, the state legislature gave us some state funding. So it's been 26 years now. We have an office in uh, several different cities, uh, six, six different remote offices right now. So, um, and, but they tend to be where most of the manufacturers are. So you work closely with Kathleen? And yeah, I would say that, uh, for instance, uh, they have the money, the loans and the grants, and we provide the technical expertise. Oftentimes, uh, to get a, a, a grant from USDA, you must do a feasibility study. And we often do the feasibility studies. That's Great interesting. Partnership. Yeah. That is a good partnership, mm -hmm. and partnerships make things happen. Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. Um, another Facebook question for Kathleen. This is an interesting one. With high rates of suicide in eastern Montana, and that's true, and additional stress factors such as inflation, is the USDA exploring new ways to bring additional support beyond telehealth? If so, what agencies are participating in this? Tough uh, question. Um, well, I was, I was going to go to telehealth because that has, um, we do have a, a program for distance learning and telehealth, and, and, and that has been an opportunity for uh, folks that are isolated. I mean, rural Montana, uh, the stigma to, to seek assistance for mental health issues and the isolation that aggravates them and the and the challenges of you know keeping a family farm going under really difficult circumstances there's really um, a lot of mental health challenges that that people need to both be comfortable talking about um, I, I actually uh, did a, a, a video um, on during Mental Health Month, talking about a program that um, that our role was to promote it, but it wasn't our program called Beyond the Weather, and it's a it's a partnership between the State Department of Agriculture and I think Northern Ag Network, um, but it's it's named because we want to have our conversations go beyond the weather, right? Okay. Into really important things. I agree. I agree entirely. Um, we had a question that came in via, um, I think, email um, from, I'm not sure where, but they sent a photo in of a weed that they have in their yard, and they wanted to know if Jane could identify this beautiful little weed. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will admit I did get to see this picture before the show tonight. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, so I think this looks like a... A, a, a species in the mint family. It might be a glaucoma species, which uh, it could be creeping Charlie. So there's two or three species you can find in Montana that might look similar to this. You know, a, a very common species that people have in their lawn is creeping Charlie. So that could be what it is. As far as controlling it, it those types of species like moist conditions. So I wonder if it isn't growing in an area of the yard that is maybe shaded or is getting extra water. So one of the ways to control it would be to try to change the conditions, either increase the sunlight, um, maybe a little less watering to try to make it a little less competitive than the grass that's growing there. Um, you can also use herbicides. There are broadleaf herbicides that will work on this, including dicamba, uh, which is sold as a lot of different products. 
and triclopyr, which, which is sold as foundation for turf applications. Uh, one note to make about those herbicides, they are broadleaved herbicides and they will impact other broadleaf species, so probably okay to use in the lawn, but you wouldn't want to use them in a flower bed or garden where if, if, that, if some of that species is also growing there. Okay, well, I have you up. I know you brought me a bouquet today, and I appreciate that, <laughs> yes. but you might want to mention what that is. Yeah, so I think I bring this species every spring season. It's pretty. Um, one of my goals is to have all the viewers of Montana Ag Live know that this is Dame's Rocket and not Phlox. So it is a kind of an invasive mustard. It has um, four petals. All mustards have four petals on the flowers. Uh, phlox will have five petals, so that's a great way to tell this from our native phlox that, or ornamental phloxes that we like to have growing. It is a really beautiful plant. Uh, it smells very nice, it, uh, but it can be kind of invasive. There are some states in the upper Midwest that have this on the noxious weed list. Montana does not, but you will find places in Montana where this is um, kind of growing up the draws. It likes some moisture. One of the places where I've seen it most prevalent is up in the Belt region. So again, we're back to central Montana, but it really likes those, uh, kind of those draws and coolies uh, up like between Belt and Fort Benton. That's one of the places I've noticed it. It does pull very easily. It's a, an annual to a biennial. And um, I did, I pulled a plant out very easily. You can see it has a very shallow mm -hmm. root system. So it's super easy to pull. I would encourage people, if you do have it growing in your, in your yard or kind of the, you know, the backwoods, um, to keep it from producing seed because it can become somewhat prolific. Okay, thank you. You mentioned Fort Benton. And here again, I'm on my... <laughs> Soapbox tour, about it. tour yeah. of Montana tonight. <laughs> Are there any small ag businesses or manufacturing? I mean, I love Fort Benton. It's one of the most beautiful cities, towns in the state, and historically, it's a great place. What's going on there? Anything that you guys know of? I know of uh, one manufacturer, very small. Uh, I cannot think of their name, but they were actually uh, making a item to help you pick apples. Hmm. Okay, so. They do have a brewery there too. They yeah. do. Yes. I, I do know that. And so that. does Belt. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Um, Kathleen, interesting question. As state director, what are your goals for the state? Um, yeah, I was asked that in my interviews, and basically what I what I said was I want to first figure out the portfolio of of rural development and where I can be helpful to support our staff and support the projects that are that are ongoing. Um, and then what I want to figure out is, is who needs the help the most across the state and then how can we help those uh, communities uh, in the most lasting, effective way possible. And, and uh, my interviewers, I think, expected me to have a, you know, a real set agenda. Um, but when I got in the position in January, uh, the, our, our national office um, charged us with uh, going out and engaging with the, the 10 communities according to their uh, metrics that were the most distressed and the least served. And so I thought, oh, there we go. This is exactly what I was saying that, that I thought we needed to do. And so we've, we've had this community engagement project going and a lot of the, and there's 10 communities across the, the state. and. Eight of those are tribal, which one could predict, and two of them are adjacent to tribal. So, so we've been working a lot with um, engaging with our, our, our tribal nations um, on a government to government and also on a partner okay. status and so seeing where right. we can help with the really significant okay. issues um, in some of those communities that, that, okay. so so that more people aren't being left behind. All right, thank you. Uh, question from Billings, and this goes back a couple of programs. We mentioned a person 
who is very knowledgeable in controlling okay. ground squirrels. I'd like to know that name again. It's Steve Van Tassel. He's with the Montana Department of Agriculture. I do not have his phone number, but you can go on the Department of Ag website and find his phone number. He's located in Lewistown. Um, Back to <laughs> Mary, we had a question here that came in from Cutbank, and their winter wheat uh, appears frosted at the tips. It is They want to know, you think this is fusarium head blight or something else? Uh, cut bank would not be my first guess for no. um, head blight. And then winter wheat also, we don't get it in normally. Um, there are some exceptions. We had some daily fogs during flowering in Haver a few years ago and we had quite a bit of head blight uh, in the winter wheat. But normally it's a spring wheat because of the temperatures required for infection at flowering. So this pathogen um, really likes uh, continuous with cereals and corn because it uh, grows saprophytically on the decaying plant matter and then it'll affect during the flowering period so that's the really important time to control it. Okay thank you. A uh, question from Stanford. They've heard of a program called International Marketing Assistance. Are you guys familiar with that one? I am. Have at it. <laughs> <laughs> it's through the uh, Montana Department of Commerce. So if you contact the Montana Department of Commerce in Helena, I'm sure they can help you. I know that they help you fund you to go to international trade shows. Okay. Um, is just international? Probably is. I'm not sure about the details. Okay. There's also the, it's a different sub-agency than we are, but it's the Agricultural Marketing Service, AMS, at the federal level. So they could look online to see if there's some assistance there. Are they also located here in Montana? Uh, there is an office here in Montana. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, but a lot of those are national programs. All right, yeah. sounds good. Um, well, oh, from Bozeman, um, a viewer would like to share that uh, IND Hemp, and I'm not sure what that is, has been operating in Fort Benton for about a year. They are making very unique hemp products. You guys familiar with those? I am, yes. And pretty successful? Yes. Are very. they growing? Yes. Good. I like those kind of little poses. <laughs> uh, here's another one from Helena. We're getting all kinds of response tonight. This is interesting. Uh, regarding manufacturing in Fort Benton. <laughs> Fort Benton has the Montana flour and grain milling operation that mills organic grains. <laughs> so, folks, there are a lot of little opportunities in rural Montana. And Kathleen, if somebody has an ideal, can they come to you and say, I have this ideal? How does the process work? That's, for that's absolutely. Rather, I mean, you can go online, you can look at the, the all the suite of programs that we have but really the the best thing to do is either pick up the phone or send an email with a question and and we'll try and figure out how to how to answer it and it's surprising how creative some of our programs can be and um and and so just yeah we've got 34 staff at six offices across the state and um you can go online and find an email or a phone number and just pick up the phone or send us a note. Okay. Same yeah. thing for you? It, absolutely. And I would say too about the USDA funding too is that there's such an opportunity there with, uh, they have funding for feasibility studies. So if you have an idea that you're not, you haven't quite vetted out, you don't know what the, what the, what your tenure, your payback is and your financials into the future, you can get a grant from USDA and then you can have somebody do it for you. So we would bid on that and we would do the feasibility study if you chose us, but it's a great opportunity for anybody that has an idea. Right. A lot going on in the state that a lot of people are not aware of. <laughs> so thank you for informing us. Uh, Jane, I like this question. They've been using Tordon, one of my favorite herbicides, because it really works, on their leafy spurge. Is there anything else they can use and anything new for that particular yeah, week. Yeah, so uh, Tordon is still one of the go-to herbicides for leafy spurge. Um, it's a long-lived herbicide and it, it's not, it doesn't harm grass, but it, it does um, injure other broadleaf species. So there are some new uh, approaches that are out there. Uh, one active ingredient that people are using is quinclorac. Uh, you can, it's sold in, you know, different products, but that's quinclorac. 
And you can use that around water, which Tordon you cannot because it, it leaches through the soil very easily and gets into to the stream words. systems and wells. Uh, we're, we're doing a trial right now with a new product called Venue um, that looks promising. We were just at those plots last, uh, last fall or last week and it looks pretty good. Um, so yeah, there's, we're trying some new things and, and seeing how things look. One comment I would like to make about Tordon is if you can use a different herbicide, I really recommend it. What we've seen over the decades of using Tordon is that a lot of times where you spray out a broad-leaved invasive plant with Tordon, you end up with cheatgrass. Yeah. And uh, cheatgrass and other annual grasses are a big concern in Montana. Okay, thank you. Steve Van Tassel is going to love me, but here's his phone number. Uh, it's 406-538-3300. Uh, Again, 406-538-3004. And when you call him with any of your rodent problems, tell him that Jack said hi. Yeah. And he may never talk to me again. Anyway, um, and here's a question from Hamilton, and I just answered it. Can someone share more information about the need to control ground squirrels in Montana? Should we avoid control since these animals are part of the ecosystem? I'd say no, but talk to Steve, and that's another phone number. You have it. Um, question from Scobie. They've heard of a program called Grant Growth Through Agriculture Grants. You guys want to jump on that? Sure, I can start. Yeah, that, that's through the Montana Department of Agriculture. Uh, very, very good grants that you can uh, get uh, to pay for feasibility studies and startups. Uh, on top of that, you also have um, value-added ag producer grants through USDA, and you also have Big Sky Trust Fund grants through the Montana Department of Commerce. So. Okay. Kathleen, you want to add anything? No, that just... Um, there's lots of programs out there and all of us that are talking about them and running them are really trying to make sure that we can mesh them and, and, and recommend other programs when, when they're the better first step or our programs are the better first step. So I know one of my priorities is to really make sure that all of the public resources out there that we're all coordinating. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mary, uh, with all the moisture we've had, this person from, again, Lewistown yeah, area would like to know what the risk is with stripe rust this year. Uh, it's pretty low. They just identified it in the Treasure Valley of Idaho. We got the email from Juliet last week and um, pretty low throughout Washington and yeah, even into the Midwest. Um, that said, if we had a warm, extended wet fall and early planted winter wheat, we might get it again. Um, but most of our varieties have some resistance and we have good fungicide products. Um, stripe rust is one of those diseases that blows in, so we can kind of watch it come in unless it's been established in the fall. Whereas head blight tends to be pretty local, although it can um, come in from other areas. So if you know you have a high head blight risk and you've had this moisture, then you might consider a fungicide. Okay. Thank you. And while I have you up, um, a viewer would like to know, he's from Belfry, and he wants the name of the person to contact at MSU about alfalfa production, fertilization, pest control, all that. Unfortunately, he does not have internet access, so he would like you to give him a name and a phone number. Oh. Um. <laughs> Uh, Hayes Goosey, our forage specialist, right. and uh, give me one minute and I'll get that number to you. <laughs> okay, that'll work. I wondered if you had all those memories. Modern technology. Um, from Haver, this is a question that came in via email ahead of time. Uh, do tariffs and customs issues affect trade between Canada and the U.S.? And is that an issue with manufacturing here in Montana? Uh, at this point, I don't think it's much of an issue compared to the other issues, workforce, housing, and supply chain. But it always is, it does affect things if you're uh, having to pay tariffs, go back and forth across the border. Okay. I don't think we have many issues right now. Right. No. I agree. And, and that's good. Um, 
for both of you. And this is an interesting question, and it comes from Missoula. What are the major limiting factors in developing a manufacturing business in a state like Montana? Uh, and I'm going to say this, but this isn't Montana specific, but workforce is, is the biggest issue right now. Uh, no matter what state you go to, no matter what part of this state you're in, uh, every manufacturer is struggling for employees. And then even if you're going to, let's say you do get the employees, then you might be hurting on housing, and especially f affordable housing. So we are seeing uh, great pressure on manufacturers in Bozeman, uh, Kalispell, and Missoula because they simply can't pay people enough so that they can afford housing. But Montana is a very business-friendly state and rank, consistently ranks very high in that. So the barriers to start in manufacturing are as low as any other state in the United States. Okay. Do we have a major issue in moving manufactured product out of the state because of our transportation infrastructure? Yes, there is an imbalance uh, of freight options. Um, so depending on which business you're in, you might, may have no problem getting raw materials in, but have problem getting trucks to take your materials out, your finished products out, and it could be the vi vice versa for other manufacturers. So just this, the simple fact that Montana doesn't have a lot of freight going in and out affects uh, our manufacturers, and we end up having a little bit higher cost because our shipping costs are higher to get to markets. Okay. You know, last week we had a question about mobile um, meat processing facilities. Do we have any of those? I think we have one in the state, but what's the potential in either of your opinions to improve or enhance mobile manufacturing for beef? Uh, I think it's uh, limited, in my opinion just that uh, the cost of picking up the system and moving it constantly, uh, trying to set up corrals and infrastructure every time you move it. Um, so I think most of them are using them, uh, are, they're, it's like a pre-built home or pre-built facility. And so even though they're, co they're mobile, they set them up and don't really move them. Okay. Well, and there's, there's a lot of uh, effort going on on the meat processing. And, and really, when we talk about transportation issues and costs, I mean, the more we can produce locally, buy locally, value add locally and regionally, the more we can keep the wealth inside Montana rather than just shipping off our, our raw products. Um, Part of the issue with meat processing is workforce, right? So Miles College, Miles City College has a, a training program and, and Northern is looking at a, a degree program. Um, there's, uh, there, are, there is you know, one unit that um, it, it isn't quite as mobile as another issue that you have to deal with with meat processing is the water, the wastewater. Um, and, so there are a lot of people trying to figure this out. Um, there was a, a movement, a move that allows uh, state inspected facilities to be a functional equivalent for federally inspected facilities. Um, you know, our producers, the the what decades ago when the uh, Packers and Stockyards Act passed, um, it was because there were only five meat processing plants in the nation at the time. And now we only have four, yes. 50 years later. And so there's been a real e effort by this administration. Um, we've got, they just rolled out a um, intermediary loaning, loan program for, um, for, for lenders to help with, with expansion of meat processing. There's all kinds of efforts. Um, in fact, a, a USDA-wide effort in food tra food system transformation. Uh, it's huge, so. Sounds good. Mary provided me with Hayes Goosey, our forage specialist. 
number for the person at Belfry, and that number is 406-994-5688. And if you have any forage questions, Hayes is really knowledgeable and will be able to help you. This is a question I find fascinating. I've been here long enough that at one point, we had pretty good air service around the state when we had Big Sky Airlines. I think we still have Cape Cod. Cape, but Cape Air. What is the future, in your opinion, of airline transportation to rural Montana? Um, I believe there was some assistance in the infrastructure, the bipartisan infrastructure law for, for airports and for services. And then, I don't know if your viewers are, are aware, but um, there's a push to reactivate the southern passenger rail route too. So, um, I saw that. yeah, which is super interesting. So we know how important uh, being able to get to Minneapolis or you know without uh, having to drive to to fly yeah. from there, um, et cetera. So I think, I mean, all, it always depends on who's in office, but I think most everyone is pretty clear on how important that subsidized air access is. Yeah. I, I could add too that when we have companies looking to move to Montana manufacturers, that's one of their big uh, requests is tell us about the air service. Yeah, so, that makes uh, it, tremendous it, sense. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, one for Jane. Person has a pasture, but they have this funny looking bluegrass moving in called bulbous bluegrass. They'd like to get rid of it. Do you want to help them? Yeah, we've talked about bulbous bluegrass before. Uh, it's very noticeable right now. Now is not the time to try to control it. Uh, you're probably looking at spring of next year and probably using a herbicide. Um, Imazepic or Plateau will work on it. Early spring applications of glyphosate will work, but it, it has to be very early because it's an early green up and early Thank maturation. So okay, thank you. Uh, Patty, this person from Fairfield is thinking of packaging pulse crops, and there are some already doing that yes. in the state. How would they go about getting a hold of you or Kathleen to find out the assistance they could get? Just give us a call. Okay, and your number has been on the screen, and yes. there it is. All right, we got a few minutes left. I'm gonna let Kathleen tell us what else you'd like to get done here in the state, and I'll cut you off when I have to. Oh, well, um, we just wanna make sure that rural Montana has a chance to, to thrive and that where we can help however, whether it's tribal community colleges and um, renewable energy and, and building your own housing and um, there's just program after program after program to help rural Montana um, be successful. Um, yeah, so we're I looking we forward can. to helping. Yeah, I like that idea. I'm going to say a couple more things. Mary wants to see you all in Moccasin on Wednesday <laughs> and in Haver on Thursday and we'll start again here in Bozeman July 7th for a Research Center Post Farm Field Day and Eastern Ag on July 12th, and we'll get to the rest of them next week. And next week's show will be the last spring series featuring women in agriculture. Krista Evans, who is the executive director of Montana Ag Business Association, will be here. You got a lot of information from her. Thank you for watching. For Have a good week. And good night. And stay Visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club.
and by the Montana Nursery and Landscape Association, a trade association of horticulture professionals who can assist with yard, gardening, and outdoor space questions. Members in your area can be found at plantingmontana.com. And by the Montana Farmers Union, a grassroots organization working for family farmers, ranchers, and rural communities. Online at montanafarmersunion.com. The programs you enjoy on Montana PBS are made possible through institutional support from both Montana State University Bozeman and the University of Montana Missoula. Montana PBS, one of the many services of Montana's university system. And by Montana Public Radio, Montana national and international news and analysis on the air every day. With blues, classical, jazz, and more, we have music day and night, news you can trust, and hand-picked music on listener support.